The word ecstasy is defined as an overwhelming feeling of great happiness or joyful excitement. But saying the word does basically nothing to conjure the feeling up in either the listener or the speaker. It doesn't even really tickle my sides, let alone give an overwhelming sense of joy. So how do you make someone feel ecstatic? How do you create the emotional response in a person that they would describe as ecstasy? Or what about frustration, perseverance, dread, or pride? I think this is really what the realm of art exists to do. The word ecstasy makes me feel nothing, but getting to the climax of a great novel might make me feel ecstatic. And that's pretty powerful when you sit back and think about it. A person with a bit of craft, skill, and luck can make someone else experience a particular emotion or thought that they want to lead them to, whether that be a painting, stage performance, or a song. I think video games are an interesting artistic medium because they rely upon the player's interaction, so they are able to lead the player to experience things from a first-person perspective and have agency in a way that no other medium can. A game can make a player feel clever or disempowered or feel proud of themselves. And I enjoy exploring how different games try to invoke different experiences within the player. Not all games do this well, though. There are many cases where the systems and mechanics of an experience are entirely divorced from the internal narrative of the experience. Like in an RPG where, while in combat, you might have a billion lasers and like literal moons crash onto your character, but he just pops right back up, but then you move to a cutscene where the hero is severely injured by some dude with a sword. Or in a military shooter where the story tells you you're some patriotic hero, while mechanically you just slaughter waves of some bad guys and never have to ask if shooting a bunch of people really makes you a hero. Or maybe in an adventure game where the characters tell you you need to be urgent because there's an emergency, but if you set the controller down, nothing actually happens, there's no timer, it's an imaginary pressure being put on the player. There's a disconnect between what the player does and how they engage with the world, and the experience and story of the characters within the game. But sometimes, a masterwork of the genre comes along and uses its mechanics in order to make the player follow and parallel the story of the protagonist, where the systems in place speak to the subtext of the story. A game where not only are the mechanics not disconnected to the experience, but they elevate the story to a more real and far more personal experience. Today, I want to talk about Celeste. Now, before I get into it, I basically plan to talk about everything that I find interesting in the game, which includes spoilers for the story, so if that's a thing you can't live with, go play the game and then come back here. Don't worry, I'll wait. It, it's really good indie precision platformer. It's worth your time, I promise. <clears throat> okay, so, part one, Madeline. Madeline is the protagonist of Celeste. She's who the game centers around, and she's also the character the player controls. So the player is invited to become Madeline, to see her perspective, to learn her lessons, and to identify with her. Madeline has come to the mountain, Celeste, in order to climb to the summit, a goal which an old lady we meet at the base of the mountain seems to doubt we're capable of doing. Madeline has a lot on her mind, and she's come to the mountain for a place of quiet reflection. We later on get to see that it's more than just some self-reflection she's looking for, but an escape from the rut she feels like her life is caught in. She came to the mountain in order to find something intangible that she can't describe. She wants to accomplish something difficult in order to break herself out of a cycle she's trapped in. Madeline suffers from depression and anxiety. While talking with Theo, she opens up about her depression, describing it like I'm at the bottom of an ocean. It's claustrophobic, yet I feel exposed. While on a gondola that loses power halfway across a chasm, she suffers a panic attack, and the sky turns black and nightmarish tentacles reach out and threaten to swallow her up. Madeline has done her best, though, not to let this ruin or rule her life. We can see that she seems to have some form of support network from a friend and from her mom when she calls them in chapter two. She opens up to Theo and is willing to talk about her experience and works to confront her anxieties later in Chapter 6, and she doesn't allow it to stop her from caring for others. In Chapter 3, we come across an abandoned hotel, 
which is effectively haunted by the late manager of the hotel, Mr. Oshiro. Mr. Oshiro continues to operate as though the resort is as lovely as it ever was, and is either in denial of or can't see the dilapidated state it's really in. Madeline offers to help Mr. Oshiro fix it up, even though it gets in the way of her own goals. So as Madeline, he go around, cleaning up laundry, scattered boxes, and just clearing junk out of the way to try and help. Mr. Oshiro doesn't seem to notice that it's Madeline actually cleaning the place, and doesn't even offer a thanks for her work. There's something I find charming though, and sweet about this section. You feel for Madeline. She's in the midst of dealing with her own problems, but she takes time aside to help someone else with theirs, even if it is thankless work. Overall though, Madeline has a lot that she's trying to manage and juggle all at the same time. She describes herself as good at keeping up appearances, but the truth is, I'm barely holding it together. And maybe you can relate to that. I certainly know what it's like to feel lost and aimless, stuck in a loop of bad habits and mentalities. Uh, for me personally, I've had to contend and continue to contend with depression. There are days where I wake up and it's it's like there's this dark cloud that just hangs over me. And it's like, that's going to be my day now. Uh, it'll feel like I'm walking around carrying a backpack full of rocks, weigh me down. Sometimes the idea of eating seems like too much work to even bother with. It's something I can manage pretty well, I think, thanks to medication, a strong support network, and therapy. But nevertheless, it still hangs over me. I'm actually making this video right now as a form of dealing with that feeling of being stuck, hoping that working on a new project that I can put myself into can help me work through these times. I find myself feeling lost and uncertain as I'm trying to find some form of hope that I can look forward to. As the world becomes more and more aware of the realities of mental illness, traversing these issues becomes more and more common for all of us. It was certainly on the mind of Matt Thorson, lead designer of Celeste, while he was making this. In an interview, he said the actual content of the story began with personal experiences. In some way, making the game may have been a way of exploring those problems for the developers themselves. Again, Matt Thorson said he didn't know how it would end because he was still dealing with the stuff while they were making it. While I don't want to project onto the developers too much, I don't know them or their situations. I personally think that Celeste was as much a therapeutic outlet for them as it was an exploration and narrative of those themes for the audience. And if I may project a little bit more, I think there's a commonality between Matt Thorson and I, and Madeline. We found ourselves stuck in a place we don't want to be, and are trying to do something to break out of it. We all hope to some degree that doing our thing will help us move past where we were and move towards a better future and a better us. Matt Thorson made a challenging platformer video game. I'm making this video essay about said video game. And Madeline has traveled to challenge the mountain and to climb to the peak. But you should know, Celeste Mountain is a strange place. You might see things, things you ain't ready to see. Part two, Celeste Mountain. From what we can learn, the mountain has a lot of history to it. At all of the different elevations on the mountain, we come across different relics of a bygone time. A decrepit city, made to house an entire workforce of some major corporation but was abandoned shortly after completion. Ruins of what looked like a medieval castle. It was an old resort, shut down many years ago and left to the elements in the passage of time. A forgotten ski trail with a gondola an ancient temple devoted to some forgotten deity. The mountain has meant so many things to so many people. There's a mixing of old and new as we move through the castle ruins only to end up at a lost payphone, or end a mountaineering trail at the steps of an eldritch temple. It gives the mountain a sense of otherworldliness, makes it feel like it's pulled out of time. But beyond the centuries of history, there's something else that makes the mountain special. From the beginning, we are warned that the mountain is strange. It doesn't take long to start to see its effect. In chapter two, while resting, Madeline enters a weird dream world version of the mountain. She delves into the ruins until she comes across an old mirror, but she doesn't see just her reflection. She sees some kind of 
evil version of herself. This anti-Madeline then breaks out of the mirror and flees. And this is our first introduction to the main antagonist of the game. Uh, as a side note, this other part of Madeline is never given a name directly within the game. She's always just referred to as a part of me, a part of you, or as a demon doppelganger once. Uh, but in the game's files, she's sometimes referred to Badalyn, and that's amazing. So that's the name I'm going to use for her. So, Badalyn is the physical manifestation of Madeline's fears, anxieties, and a negative internal dialogue. Whatever magic exists on the mountain took something from inside of her and made it into the specter that begins to plague and antagonize Madeline for the rest of the game. Apparently, this is what the old lady was warning us about when she said you might see things you weren't ready to see. But this isn't the only way the mountain will make physical manifestations of characters' internal psyche. We see things really come to a head in Chapter 5, the Mirror Temple. Upon finding an old temple built hundreds of years before the events of the game, Theo, fellow mountaineer, Madeline's new friend, and all-around easy-go-lucky dude, decides to go in and explore, despite Madeline's warning that an evil version of herself might be lurking around waiting to pounce. Not long after waltzing in, Theo disappears, so Madeline journeys deeper in trying to find her lost friend. The temple itself starts to change around her, it starts to get darker, more claustrophobic as we progress. Eventually, we find an enlarged mirror, and Theo is trapped inside it. Ever-responsible Madeline promises to get him out, but while talking, Theo gets the feeling that something is nearby, so he decides to hide. So we make haste until we can find a room with an appropriately foreboding mirror that then traps us within it. When Madeline awakens, we can see that the temple has changed again. The walls are now tinted blood red, and writhing tendrils reach out, threatening to grab Madeline. The temple is no longer just eerie or brooding, but is now outright ominous and sinister. When suddenly, who do we see but Badeline? Our ever-vigilant hero confronts her and blames Badeline for causing the temple to morph into its grotesque form and for stealing away Theo. Badeline, however, says this isn't her doing. The mountain gave shape to her, and the temple is now magnifying that effect, making it even stronger and delving even deeper into Madeline's mind. And from even deeper inside her, the mountain pulls even worse things. Now there are these ghoulish, beholder-like creatures called Seekers that start to hunt her down. They're relentless, constantly charging after Madeline, and if they catch her, she dies. They can't be killed, or at least not readily or easily, only temporarily subdued. Our boy Theo finds himself trapped in his own unique personal hell. When we find him, he's trapped inside of a crystal. The walls around him have grown eyes that stare at him unendingly, judging him. Their judgment is inescapable, and he's stuck to remain on a pedestal for them forever. It seems that Badeline was right, and both of our heroes know it. For Madeline, the mountain has brought out these untiring monstrosities that hunt her down, mirroring the way her own fears, doubts, and anxieties cannot be outrun. Likewise, Theo is trapped in a glass cage, unable to hide from the prying eyes around him, perhaps mirroring the Instapix followers that he is constantly trying to appease behind that glass screen of his phone. His own ego is a kind of prison that haunts him. This is the power of the mountain. It delves into your mind and will bring to light things that you didn't know were there or didn't want to admit was there. Celeste forcibly exposes their internal fears to each other and to themselves. It doesn't create or fabricate these things, merely brings them to light. A very mystical power to have. Because it was the temple that was magnifying the power, the Seekers don't chase our heroes beyond the walls of the temple. But Madeline has to deal with Badeline for the whole game, as opposed to just one chapter. Part 3. Badeline. Badeline is made manifest by the mountain, but she isn't created by the mountain. 
She's a part of Madeline long before she makes her way to Celeste Mountain. She represents that nagging voice in Madeline's head that tells her she's not good enough. She's the personification of all of Madeline's self-doubts. She isn't just negative speech and self-destructive patterns, though. She has her own personality and perspectives. She acts as a different viewpoint to Madeline's situation and her problems. She has ambitions and motives. She's like a full-fledged person in the same way that Madeline is. Madeline hates Madeline. I mean, she literally outright says she hates her a couple of times, like no ambiguity there. To Madeline, this other part of her are all of the worst traits about herself. She calls Madeline cruel, paranoid, and controlling. She sees this part of herself as an obstacle that needs to be overcome. And large parts of the game is Madeline basically trying to pummel Madeline into submission. She blames her for all the things that have gone wrong to her. Mr. Oshiro lashing out at them, the gondola stalling out, Theo being trapped in the temple. Unlike the other obstacles on the mountain though, she can't escape this other part of her. She seems to be pretty aware that she's literally fighting herself the entire way, but that doesn't stop her from trying to just beat Madeline down to no avail. What she ultimately wants is to be able to just leave Madeline behind, or to have her under complete control, like a tool or a machine. But is she right to think that? Madeline clearly says things that are harmful and unhelpful, but she also seems to be trying to warn Madeline of dangers ahead. She never really seems like she's lying to us, and in some cases, she even finds ways to help Madeline out. How does Madeline see things? Madeline describes herself as a concerned observer and the pragmatic part of Madeline. She worries that Madeline is getting in over her head and is going to get overwhelmed. She doesn't think Madeline has what it takes to climb the mountain and sees her as just stubbornly running directly towards her own failure, frustrations, and defeat. Madeline constantly suffers at the hands of Madeline. From the very beginning, Madeline calls this part of her creepy, weak, and lazy. Not off to a great start there. Even when she is trying to just talk with Madeline, she is subject to constant insults and blame for things she isn't responsible for. To her, Madeline is completely unreasonable and unwilling to stop and listen to what she has to say. Madeline is scared. She's scared of what could go wrong on the mountain, what Celeste could do to Madeline. She's scared that once Madeline leaves the mountain, she will disappear again and go back to being without a body or a voice altogether. She's scared that Madeline will completely abandon her and leave her behind. And at no point is she able to get Madeline to understand or even acknowledge her fears, and is maligned for even attempting to do so. While Madeline is by no means blameless in her actions or speech, she has a point here. She's constantly trying to look out for Madeline and her well-being, and instead of being heard or understood, she's constantly vilified. She never gets to explain herself, her concerns are never addressed, she just gets beaten back down, and then listens to Madeline whine about how Madeline is never on her side. Her perspective feels, like, really legitimate. If someone I cared for was constantly lashing out for me for trying to help, I'd probably feel cold and jaded too. Madeline is blind to her own unwillingness to listen to Madeline, and how the abuse she is directed towards her has directly led to some of these problems. She doesn't acknowledge the ways in which Madeline has been trying to help. Madeline doesn't see how her attempts to dissuade Madeline have been ineffective, and at times, more damaging than the things she is trying to get Madeline to avoid. She doesn't try to work through or resolve these problems, only circumvent or ignore them. This conflict between the two halves of our protagonist, the yin and the yang of Madeline, comes to a head at the pivotal chapter 6, Reflection. Immediately following the Mirror Temple, Theo and Madeline have a heart-to-heart -heart and they open up to each other about the things they saw and experienced in the temple. They offer advice and understanding to each other before drifting off the rest with an optimistic view of the future and the summit only a day away. And in her dreams, the mountain does what the mountain does and Madeline decides to have a talk with Madeline. While we may have hoped that Madeline has made some sort of progress thanks to the conversation, and maybe we'll begin to better understand Madeline, we quickly see that her perspective really hasn't changed at all. She says, I finally understand who you are. You're everything I need to leave behind. I don't need you anymore. 
Think about this conversation from Madeline's perspective. She listens to Madeline say, I finally understand who you are, but instead of showing any real understanding, she says she needs to leave Madeline behind, lists the qualities that make Madeline a monster, and then tops it off by saying she doesn't need her and will be happier once she abandons Madeline. All of Madeline's fears are point by point justified. She hasn't been heard, she's a monster for trying to help, and Madeline is making a conscious effort to try and eliminate her. So unsurprisingly, this sends Madeline into a frenzy. Her whole existence is threatened by this other part of her that's looking down on her. And so Badalyn throws Madeline off the ledge, and she careens to the bottom of the mountain. Her quest is over. Done for. She was so close. But it's over now. But there is a glimmer of hope. Through the fall and climbing back out, Madeline takes a moment to look at her reflection in a crystal. Part 4. A Part of Me Everything about the game has been leading up to this point, to this revelation. Why won't she leave me alone? Because she can't leave you alone, she's a part of you. She will always be there with you. You can attempt to beat her into submission, you can try to ignore her, or learn to limit her influence, but you can never get rid of her. And any attempt to destroy this other part of her is an exercise in self-sabotage and futility. Madeline has treated the other part of herself as an enemy, as opposed to a friend. So far, none of Madeline's other techniques have done anything to begin to resolve the conflict between them, so maybe it's time for a new approach. Here again, we meet the same old woman from the base of the mountain, and she speaks her advice to Madeline. This part of you that's holding you back, go talk to her. Figure out why she's so scared. Don't just tell her what you think, but listen to what she thinks. Go and understand her first. I personally love this one line where she really quickly reframes the whole mountain and its power with just a few words. Celeste Mountain is a place of healing, my dear. The first step of healing is confronting the problem. It's never easy. The challenges and difficulties literally climbing a mountain presents is a metaphor for this headlong confrontation of our internal struggles and issues. It's hard, uncomfortable, and it comes with setbacks. But ultimately, it's an act of healing. Facing our problems as they are and truly coming to a place of understanding, not trying to will the problem away or just bootstrap yourself out of them. It's brilliant symbolism. So Madeline does, she goes, and she talks to the other part of her. Based on all of the events prior, the part of her is obviously not super jazzed to hear from Madeline, and she has legitimate doubts that she really wants to work together. But reluctantly, they do talk. And admittedly, this is the point where I think the narrative of the story is a tad weak. They don't have to talk for more than a couple of lines to begin working out their issues, and I would have liked a little bit more building here in dialogue, but we'll come back to this in a second. Here we also see a really cool break from the rest of the game in that Madeline, for the first and the only time, gets a new power. She gains a second dash. There is a mechanical change to symbolize the narrative change in the characters. It's such a great touch. It gives the power up a significance and a rationalization too. Now that the other part of her is helping Madeline, she literally helps out by giving her a second dash. It makes sense, and it's thematic. Two for one. Now that the two have paired together, it's time to attempt the climb again. With their newfound teamwork, another shot at the peak. And so the player begins a gauntlet run through a microcosm of all the levels previous. One last test of skill for the player on their journey up to the summit. One final brutal platforming challenge 
for the player to act as the final showcase of their skills. Oh yeah, have I mentioned how hard this game is? Part 5. Difficulty. Holy fuck, this game is hard, dude. It's so hard, dude. Oh, the first time I played Chapter 1, it took me over two hours to drag Madeline's beaten corpse across the finish line. On the save file I used to record the footage for this video, I accumulated over 4,000 deaths. Like, even if you're good at the game, there is still a steep difficulty curve. And it may take a player hundreds of hours to see absolutely everything that the game has to offer. Celeste always has more challenges to place in front of the player. Oh, complete a level, did you? Did you get all those strawberries? Oh, you got all the strawberries? Did you find the even more difficult B-side version of the chapter? You beat a bunch of the B-sides? Have you played the core, a new area with new tricks and traps? You beat the core? Have you completed all the stages deathless? Collected the moonberry yet? Like, beating the game is a challenge in and of itself, but each of those new steps can take hours upon hours of work and devotion to accomplish. Now granted, none of those are required to see and experience the core of what the game has to offer, but it's still gonna take a serious level of dedication, effort, and time if you wanna make it to the credits. Cause you're gonna die, and die, and die, over, and over, and over. If you haven't actually played the game for some reason, the difficulty in this game comes from its strict inputs and timing windows, and the small margin for error that you have to work with. It is the most fair, difficult game I've ever played. There are basically no RNG elements to it, and the controls are incredibly tight and responsive. The player has a remarkably granular control over Madeline's movement. So the struggle is twofold. First, figuring out what it is that the game wants you to do. It's kind of like a puzzle game in this regard, as you try to find this series of inputs and moves to get you to the next screen, to the strawberry or whatever. And secondly, executing on what it wants you to do. So at the start of the game, you are asked to time some jumps properly and chain together some small strings of jumps and dashes. But by the end, you'll be asked to navigate between a moving platform, two constantly elevating walls, and spikes all around with no safe place to speak of. And the margin for error is minuscule. Now, the game is designed with this difficulty in mind. And so the developers do a bunch of neat little things to try and ease some of the frustrations the players may experience. For instance, death is fast. There's a very small delay between jumping into some spikes and being right back at the start screen to try again. There's enough time to give you a chance to breathe, but it gets you right into your next attempt. You don't have to stare at some game over screen or rewatch a cutscene for the billionth time. The game also has a lot of compassion for the player. The loading screens will cheer you on with be proud of your death count. The more you die, the more you're learning. Keep going. Or reminding you to take breaks and step away sometimes if it's too much for you. When you talk to Granny in Chapter 6, Reflection, one of the things she tells you is that if it's too much for you, there's no shame in going home. One day you'll be ready, and you'll be back. It's a nice moment where we realize that all of the times she's offered to help Madeline back to her car was not a statement of doubt of her abilities, but an offer of assistance if she wasn't ready for the mountain's trials. If in her own kind of blunt, direct way. It's a bunch of minor touches that add to the overall feel of the game. The game is hard, but the developers and the game are all rooting for you. They're saying, keep trying, I know you'll make it eventually. In an interview with Kotaku, Matt Thorson said, it felt like to us that we needed to show the same kindness to the player that we want to show ourselves. If you go into the assist mode, you have the option of changing all kinds of options in order to enable the game to be more accessible for those who face certain disabilities or are new to games or what have you. From slowing down the game speed to infinite jumps to literally turning death off, the player has a powerful array of tools to ensure that the game can remain accessible regardless of situation. And in there, the developers make the goal and theme of the game absolutely clear. Celeste is intended to be challenging but rewarding experience. 
the game offers great tools to ensure it's playable for everyone, but asks you to experience the game in this particular way. Hard, but rewarding. You could give yourself infinite jumps and disabled deaths and breeze through the game and get to the credits in a couple of hours, but doing so would take away from what the game wants to be and what it has the potential to be when the difficulty isn't unnecessarily artificially lowered. Do you remember at the beginning when I was talking about mechanics elevating narrative to even greater heights? This is the thing that elevates Celeste to the level of a masterpiece. The way that the difficulty and the mechanics tie the player together to that whole narrative I just spent like half an hour explaining. Celeste is brutal at times. The game constantly asks more and more of your skills as a player and your patience as a person. And Celeste is the story of a girl facing the struggles of working through her own mental insecurities and anxieties. And you know what both of those things have in common? They're both really fucking hard to do. And you are going to experience setback after setback. You have to sit there and look defeat in the face because you know the reason you just died is because you screwed up. You missed the jump. The game isn't unfair. The controls are super tight. If you die, it's your fault. And you have to pick yourself up and try again if you want to climb the mountain. You're going to get frustrated. You're going to need to take breaks. Through the game's difficulty, the player will experience from a first-hand perspective the same frustration that Madeline experiences in trying to traverse the mountain and trying to work through her internal battles. And the game provides what it believes will help in that goal. The only way Madeline can climb the mountain, the only way you can climb your mountain, is by sitting with and understanding the other part of you. The part of you that is scared. The part of you that doubts your abilities and worth. When you learn to listen to and work with the other part of you, instead of against, then you can climb the mountain. Then can Celeste Mountain do its healing work. And because you never get any new abilities or skills, aside from the one exception I mentioned earlier, the only reason you can clear a screen or a chapter or the game is because you, the player, did the hard thing and stuck it out. You, the player, put in work, time after time, death after death, attempt after attempt. As Matt Thorson puts it, character growth walks in step with player growth, so that as Madeline is growing and improving, the player is too. After clearing the summit, if you go back and replay the first chapter again, it is a cakewalk in comparison to your first go at it. You'll make jumps without even thinking that not a dozen hours ago had you stuck trying to figure it out. And since you, the player, did the hard thing, persevered through all the trials and tribulations to see Madeline to the summit, the game holds a mirror up to you and says that you, the player, can also do the hard thing and climb the mountain inside of you. Because you've already done it once now. Part 6. Farewell. About a year and a half after Celeste's release, the team put out an epilogue, a final capstone on the story and the experience of Celeste. It's called Farewell, and it delivers on everything that the base game is. The story, the theming, the music, and yes, the gut-punching difficulty. If you thought the main game is hard, well, you're right. But this is even harderer. M more harder? Harder. <laughs> like, I don't have any footage from beyond the first third of Farewell because I can't even beat it yet. I have almost 50 hours in this game and I'm not even close to finishing up this chapter yet. I died 131 times in this one stupid room and this is nothing. I watched a speedrun to see how it was supposed to look and they don't even do the room. They do an even worse series of tricks in order to skip it because it's faster. Like, excuse me? But it's good. 
they somehow found a way to challenge people who were at the top of the mountain again. They made levels for the people who couldn't get enough of the game and had built a mastery over the controls and said, Oh, you like that, huh? Well, how about a ton more of it? You like that, do you? There's a bunch of little fan service -y details in this update. For example, mega pros at the game found a way to make Madeline's hitbox smaller during dashes called demo dashing. That's basically just a developer oversight and use it to skip some portions that the developers never intended. And as you might expect, it's a very precise and difficult input to do. And in the update, not only did they not fix this bug, they actually made some of the demo dashes a pixel or two easier to do and added a little secret path in Farewell that you can only get to by demo dashing perfectly. It shows the kind of relationship the devs have with their audience, that they saw people getting so invested in their game that they were finding these absurd little details in the mechanics and really exploring the full potential of what could be done. And instead of punishing them for not playing the game in the way they originally intended, they saw the passion people put in and gave a helping hand and a subtle nod to those who put in that work. It's truly wonderful. It's the developer-player relationship that gamers fantasize about. But what's really great is getting to see how the characters have evolved since the first ending of the game. Farewell acts as a time skip, so we get to see how the characters have matured and grown since we left them. For me, this section also resolves the main issue I had with the weaker writing back in Reflection. So in Reflection, my main gripe with the narrative beats was that in only a few short lines of dialogue and a hug, Madeline and the other part of her agree to put their differences aside and work together. This came across to me as, I don't know, a bit saccharine? It's got like the same vibe as like an after school special where everyone learns their lesson at the end and lives happily ever after, that kind of thing. They do get more dialogue and character development throughout the summit climb, which does lessen this and helps it feel more genuine and thoughtful. And don't mistake me here, I don't think that it's bad by any definition. It just felt a bit quick, like everything resolves too nicely with a little bow on it. It's just it's too neat. And then Farewell completely obliterates that. When faced with Granny's death, oh, uh, spoilers, I guess. I mean, I already warned you about that, but... When faced with Granny's death, we see Madeline start to slip back into old habits and mindsets. She starts chasing after a bird, convinced that it's the lingering spirit of Granny, as she refuses to truly acknowledge her death. She becomes more and more desperate for some sign of hope that Granny is alive in the bird somehow and hasn't left Madeline. But it's futile. The bird is just a bird. Though I guess in this case, it's more like a scapegoat. She's mad at herself for not going to the funeral and she lashes out both at herself and at the other part of herself. It shows that the process of confronting and healing is just that, a process. It isn't some moment that revolutionizes Madeline's life overnight, but a continual struggle of self-improvement that deeply connects to the main theme of overcoming difficulty. It was a process that Madeline was seeing great progress in until an unexpected tragedy saw her losing ground she had worked so hard to gain. But even in this backsliding, we get to see how these two reflections, Madeline and the other part of her, have grown and matured. The other part of her doesn't enable Madeline, and she refuses to be a part of Madeline's self-sabotage and her spiraling. Both narratively and mechanically, Madeline loses her double dash ability for almost the entirety of the chapter, and she works really hard to talk Madeline down and to communicate thoughtfully. Madeline allows herself to eventually listen to the other part of her that is telling her she is spiraling. While she does lash out at times, in the end, she is able to listen in a way that old Madeline couldn't have. And she relies on the other part of her to dig back out of the hole she's in. Celeste Mountain is a place of healing, my dear. Madeline confronts the reality of Granny's death, says her goodbye, and can begin to heal and move forward again. 
And that's how the game ends. We're left with Madeline returning back into the world and picking up the pieces of her life where she had left them. It's a message of hope that reiterates the main theme of growth and improvement, self-love and support. The team behind Celeste is also saying their farewell to the game. This was their final update, and they have gone to work on their next project, which I wait for with much anticipation. They've mentioned that they have no plans to release anything more for Celeste, and there's no Celeste 2 in the works. And personally, I don't want any more Celeste. Celeste is a phenomenal masterpiece of the medium. It's a game that delivers fun and satisfying gameplay, a moving and interesting story, and a heartwarming message of self-understanding and perseverance all in one package. And I don't think it needs to say anything more. It's a complete experience from start to finish, and adding more content would only dilute the quality of the content that already exists. In a way, I think, like Madeline, I'm gonna keep coming back to Celeste. I think at times I need to be reminded of what I've done, what I can do, and to reflect on new areas in my mind and my thoughts. Celeste Mountain is a strange place. You might see things, things you ain't ready to see. It's never easy. But the view from the summit is worth the climb. Thanks for watching. Hey, I just wanted to say I really appreciate you if you actually made it this far. 40 minutes is a long time to listen to some guy waffle on about a video game. Uh, I had a lot of fun making this and I put a lot of work into it. Uh, it's the first time I've ever done anything like this, any kind of video essay essay, video editing stuff. Uh, I have a ton of ideas for future topics and essays that I want to write, and I promise they won't be all this long. So if you like this video, please, you know, push the little like button and maybe subscribe to the channel. Uh, doing that doesn't actually really do anything for the algorithm, but seeing the numbers go up will help validate my self-esteem. So uh, go out and do something that brings you joy today, and uh, I'll see you in the next one. Take care.